Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 4th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our take on the coming election cycle. Second, a deeper look at one of the winners and the resulting losers of this past Alaska legislative session. And third, what did we learn about the Alaska LNG project from the Alaska governor's China trip. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Every week, Brad Keithley comes on board. He's with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, uh, which is an organization that's dedicated to making Alaska better. Making Alaska better he joins us this morning to discuss, well, the new political season. We're about to come right out of the legislative session and now into the thick of it uh, on new candidates and more. Brad Keithley joins us this morning with his weekly top three. Good morning, Brad. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? Well, I got to tell you, it's uh, I'm just looking at all this and thinking, my gosh, I'm going to be so sick of politics by the day. You think you're tough during the session. Now we're going to go through 10 weeks of uh, of uh, election season with a whole slew of candidates. It's going to be it's going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to getting some rundown here and uh, and having some discussions with you on it. Let's kick things off on your weekly top three here. With, of course, the big guns, the big race, the one that just got immediately crowded. And that, of course, is the race for governor. I saw you post a couple things that raised a few eyebrows. First and first and foremost, uh, you posted something. I knew what you meant, but I know that there were some people out there and they immediately started asking questions. When you said this is a good thing that baggage is getting into the race and people were like, oh, that Brad Keithley is really a Democrat. He's jumping. He's going in for, for baggage. Um, tell us, uh, you, wrote, you wrote that it was a good thing that baggage got in the race. Let's talk for a second about that to begin with. Well, what I said was it's a good day for the PFD right. when, uh, when, when baggage, baggage announced for the race. Baggage wrote, uh, 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 former senator wrote a uh, op-ed piece in the ADN uh, several months ago now uh, during the session that was an advocacy piece for the PFD. And, and in his announcement uh, on the sidewalk after he had filed, uh, he raised the PFD uh, again uh, as an issue uh, uh, that he's taking with the governor and with, and with other politicians. So I think, I think what that did was raise the profile of the PFD throughout the election cycle, not only now uh, do we have the Republican, at least one of the Republican candidates uh, talking about the PFD, but now we're going to have the Democrat candidate talking about the PFD. Uh, there was a chance, there is a chance that uh, the pro-PFD Republican uh, uh, doesn't make it through the primary, that there could be a, a PFD cut a Republican candidate. We'll talk about that in a moment. But baggage being in the race, uh, keeps the PFD issue out there and uh, and is a way that I think is going to uh, increase the volume on that issue uh, through the election cycle. Certainly, Begich looks like he's going to use it as a as a as a tool to distinguish himself from Governor Walker, uh, and will certainly I think be talking about it as he as he takes on the governor um, in the cycle. That doesn't I mean that doesn't mean I. You're right. Some people, when I when I made that comment that it's a good day for the PFD, 
um, some people immediately, and, and it had a, the link I had had a picture of, of baggage. Uh, I think some people immediately jumped to the conclusion <laughs> that perhaps I was now tilting toward baggage, but it's not. I mean, we, we've got the, P, the, the, the important thing to me is to have the PFD in the race, uh, in, in the cycle, uh, both in the primary and in the general. And, and I think uh, Begich's announcement, Begich's entry is going to guarantee that we have that. Yeah, and I think that this focuses it back on probably the number one issue that faces more Alaskans than anything else. I mean, we could talk about crime. We could talk about the economy as a whole. But the number one factor, I think, that's contributing to, to all of those things is the loss of the PFD over the last two years uh, to the Alaskan people. It has had a deeper impact. Um, you probably wouldn't have all the crime. You've had, you'll have some of it for sure. You probably wouldn't have all the crime if the economy was not in the crapper in part. And this recession had been lengthened because of the fact that the legislature lacked the internal fortitude to do something with government instead of just cutting into the PFD. Yeah. The thing, the thing about the PFD and I've, and I've, made this clear in several posts over the months and, and, and again in a recent post. The thing about the PFD that's important to me is its impact on the overall economy and on Alaska families. Uh, it, it, the, the cutting the PFD, uh, this is the ICER analysis in 2016. If you go back through history, uh, it's been the ICER analysis and other economic analysis uh, throughout. Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. And it has uh, the, the is by far the costliest of all the alternatives to Alaska families. It's an economic issue. It's not a moral issue, or uh, to some it is, but it's not to, to me. It's not. It's not a moral issue. It's not a. It. it, it I mean, there are fairness aspects to it uh, uh, as well. There are poverty aspects to it, but ultimately, to me, it's an economic issue. What's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy? That's going to be. And that word overall is going to be one that I just hammer on again and again and again. And what's in the best interest of Alaska families? We talk about wanting to keep family cohesion. We talk about wanting to make sure that families are involved in the education process. There's a, I mean, we, we revolve a lot of policy uh, around family and, and around the family unit. And so what is the best state policy economically in terms of, of Alaska families? That's what the PFD is. I mean, to me, that's, it's a central economic issue. And so when somebody talks about cutting the PFD, that's code to me for saying, I'm going to favor some segments of the economy over others. I'm not worried about the overall economy. I'm worried about some segments uh, uh, more than others. We'll talk about this a little bit in the second segment when we talk about uh, uh, Matt Buxton's uh, uh, eight top things or, or eight winners from the legislature. But it's, it's, it's the overall economy uh, that I think is the issue. So keeping the PFD in this election cycle, both in the general uh, or both in the, in the primary, and we've got uh, Mike Dunleavy, he's got, Senator Mike Dunleavy, he's going to do that on the Republican side in the primary. And now for certain having it in the general because baggage carries it into the general. That keeps, that to me, keeps the overall economy at the central focus and keeps Alaska families at the central focus. So, right. yeah, I think it is the number one issue. There's a lot of things that spread off that. Uh, and at the core, but at the core, it's an overall economic issue. And, and I think what we have now is we have this extremely crowded governor's race, which just, I mean, you know, at this last minute uh, with these two last candidates has really kind of created this field. Um, put on your prognosticator hat for me and let's let's talk a little bit about this, because I quite honestly welcome the addition of baggage to the race for a couple of reasons. Um, I knew it was going to force Walker to either make a choice. He was either going to have to move out of the primary and try and face it as a third wheel independent or he was going to have to duke it out of the primary, which I thought, you know, would be catastrophic for him. That would be the worst case scenario in, from my mind, because I think Begich would decimate him in a Democratic primary because Begich is the fair haired boy. I mean, somebody somebody posted something to me the other day. They said, yeah, they were comparing him. To some, well, some Democrat was comparing him to Christ. Uh, I mean, they really love Mark Begich in the Democratic Party. Um, but now that he's decided to run externally and run as an independent in the general, that opens up kind of a whole new thing um, for whoever ends up with a Republican nomination, because effectively we've got a combined independent Democratic ticket on the governor's side as the incumbent with Byron Malott. Then you've got baggage. 
Then you've got whoever the Republican ends up being. My hope is, is that it's Mike Dunleavy. But it, it ends up being a three-way race. And in this situation, it always seems like in a three-way race, the two candidates who have like identities uh, end up squabbling it out over their pieces. And usually that brings the third-party candidate within striking range of victory. Yeah, I, there's a there's a dynamic here that I'm not sure um, it, 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 any of the prognosticators can yet or, or have fully absorbed. And again, that's the PFD. I don't I don't mean to sound like you know a one note piano here, but but I I, I think it's a it's an overwhelmingly important uh, issue in this cycle. And, and let's let's break it into the into the primary and then into the general. In the primary. Uh, Mike Dunleavy uh, uh, is the is the pro PFD candidate. He's the keep the PFD candidate, uh, and will run on that issue. I think Mead Treadwell's late entry uh, is is simply a consequence of the fact that neither Scott Hawkins nor uh, Mike Chenault had gathered any fire. Uh, Johnny Binkley, for whatever reason, didn't want to run uh, or chose not to run, and so Treadwell was sort of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, 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 the business community's candidate that's coming in. Uh, at the at the late at the at the last hour, I think Dunleavy wins that race. Looking forward, I think Dunleavy wins that race. If you look at at the Republican at, at the at the um, uh, strength of Republican candidates who are coming from the Chamber of Commerce side, uh, they've tended not to win the primaries. I mean, right. uh, you go, you go back to Murkowski. Murkowski was sort of viewed as the savior of the party when he came in and in uh, 2002, but then by 2006, um, and they sort of cleared the field for Murkowski in 2002. He was the business community candidate. They sort of cleared the Republican field. But by 2006, that's faded. Uh, you got Johnny Binkley, who comes in as sort of the new uh, Chamber of Commerce, Commerce candidate. Uh, Sarah Palin swamps them both. Um, and then you got 2010 uh, with, uh, 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 par- with Sarah having retired, Parnell having replaced her. Uh, Ralph Samuels was the Chamber of Commerce candidate, the right. business community candidate. He loses in the primary. Uh, 2014, Parnell's the incumbent, so he really doesn't get challenged. Um, uh, but he loses. He sort of becomes the Chamber of Commerce candidate, uh, and Walker overtakes him. So now you've got, now we come to 2018 or yeah, 2018, and you've got uh, sort of Meade coming in at the last minute as the as the Chamber of Commerce business community uh, candidate. And he'll have some strength, and he'll have some money, and he'll have some support. But I think, by and large, Dunleavy wins that, and he wins it on the pro PFD. Uh, he, he wins it with, in, in part, because of the pro PFD position. Right. Then you get to the gen- then you get to the general, and I think the general can go one of two directions. If Dunleavy wins, then you've got then then the PF then you've got two pro PFD candidates, um, and it'll be interesting to see how that divides. I mean. Alaskans would, I think, would tend to go with Dunleavy, but Begich is going to try to make a lot of uh, a lot out of Dunleavy's social positions, uh, and we'll see how Alaskans uh, respond to that. Uh, but I but I feel pretty good about the PFD's prospect in that cycle. Um, I feel pretty good that either Begich or Dunleavy will be a stronger candidate than, than Walker. Um, if Treadwell would happen to win uh, the a Republican primary. Uh, if he if he overtakes Dunleavy and wins the Republican primary, um, then we've got a much different dynamic in the general. And frankly, this may be more uh, a factor in Begich's calculation than anything else. Then you've got uh, a PFD cut candidate at Walker, and you've got a PFD cut, cut candidate, a business community candidate uh, in in uh, in Treadwell. And Begich is sort of the only pro PFD candidate out there, and I think there's a segment of what would otherwise be a Republican vote that that leaves Treadwell and uh, and supports uh, uh, Begich on on the PFD issue. There's a lot of reasons not to support Begich, um, but but the PFD I think will be a central issue. He'll run on it hard, and I think I think Begich has a has a path to victory. I know that. I know that people say, well, you got Walker and Begich who are going to be you know, viewed as, as alike. The Republican candidate will win because Walker and Begich split the vote. But if the Republican candidate is Treadwell, um, Begich sort of has the PFD issue all to himself, uh, uh, the pro-PFD position all to himself, and I think runs a lot stronger 
in that situation than than uh, than people realize. So I I think Dunleavy wins the Republican primary. I think the pro PFD side wins the Republican primary. Comes into the general, and you've got two pro pro PFD candidates, and they sort of they sort of go at each other. Uh, and Dunleavy ultimately prevails. But if Treadwell wins that Republican primary, I think the dynamics shift dramatically. And and, and I think Begich has a, has a much stronger position in that situation. Well, and let's look at this through the optics of, uh, I mean, neither you or I are real fans of, uh, of Donald Trump. But let's look at the let's look at it through the optics of how Trump got elected. Again, kind of the outsider, kind of the guy that wants to break up. The good old boy thing, you know, is whether he's done that or not is debatable, Um, you know, but kind of the drain the swamp kind of mentality. And you look at this Treadwell. uh, I mean, I agree that both uh, Hawkins and Chenault are both underwhelming in their responses so far. So you've got Treadwell and you've got um, Mike Dunleavy. Uh, Treadwell is a nice guy. He's a friend of mine. I like him, but he is. Very much the epitome of, as you say, the Chamber of Commerce, the good old boy, the standardized GOP, crony capitalist kind of pro guy, whereas Dunleavy has got the track record. I mean, he has been thrown out of the caucus for standing on principles. He has been espousing the unpopular view amongst the establishment that the PFD needs to be enshrined. Uh, I mean, he really shows and shines on a lot of those issues that I think appeals to the same kind of folks who you know voted for Donald Trump simply because he was different, simply because he said what he meant and he and he and he took a stand, uh, you know, in their minds on a lot of these issues, and I think that that also plays into his ability to defeat a well-known name of Meade Treadwell. Yeah, I I think so too. I the the, the issue the issue that that I think. Uh, Senator Dunleavy has some vulnerability on our social issues. He's he's a he's highly socially conservative. Um, I think that's led him to take some positions that people will t- want to talk about. He's going to be pressed. I mean, he he talks about the P- preserving the current PFD uh, as well as as no taxes. So he's going to be pressed very hard on how he's going to fit that all in a diminished revenue box right. uh, and how this is all going to work out. He's going to be pressed hard on where he makes cuts. If, if he's able, I mean, you and I remember the great Sarah Palin, deba- the great debates of 20 of 2006, right? Where right. is, is Tony Knowles, Sarah and Andrew Halco, ha- Andrew Halcrow. And they kept pressing Sarah uh, on all sorts of issues. Sarah kept this, you know, Alaska Constitution with her, and always said, you know, when she didn't understand the question or didn't have a position, she said, "Well, I'll go consult the Alaska Constitution." If Dunleavy's able to keep it high like that, keep his re- rhetoric and his responses high like that, he'll probably, uh, I think, get, sustain that that sort of position through the general or through the primary, certainly, and, and be able to sustain it and, and try to sustain it through the general. Uh, there's a danger that he will get drugged down into uh, specifically where he's going to make these cuts, generate all sorts of of of, of, of opposition because of that, uh, and and there's a, there's a there's a chance that it, between his position on social issues and 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 being drugged down into the battle of where he's going to make these cuts and generating opposition because of that, there's a chance Treadwell could. Could move past him in the in the uh, in the primary, but I, I think if if Dunleavy's good at staying sort of higher up the chain, uh, uh, higher up the rhetoric in terms of how he's going to make his economic policy work, um, and if he's good at responding on the social issues, he will you know make it through the primary and and, and be the Republican candidate in the general. The bottom line is is that this is good for defenders of the PFD again because. <laughs> If we do end up with a Dunleavy, Begich, Walker race, um, the two prime candidates are both pro protect the PFD in a positive way, not in the way that Walker talks about protecting the PFD, but in an in a true enshrining and giving it back to the people in the way that was originally intended. Um, I'm not sure I would love a governor Begich um, because of all the other baggage that would come with it, but uh, I am uh, I am excited to see at least that this is going to become probably the prime issue of the campaigns because I, 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 like I said earlier, I think it is the root cause 
of many of the ills inside the state of Alaska right now. Yep. Well, I I, I think that um, uh, it should it should come out well. Certainly, Dunleavy of, of the candidates who have now announced the the field that we have out there, Dunleavy certainly is the most fiscally conservative, the most in line on fiscal issues. Uh, certainly with the the way I view things and and I think other fiscal conservatives view things. So, yeah, I think he's the primary candidate. But, um, you know, if we get to the general and and somehow Treadwell's overtaken him uh, in the primary, uh, it'll be that's going to be that's going to be an interesting choice uh, for a lot of people. Probably a, a I, I, I have some sense of where I would go in that situation. I just hope I don't have to go there. Right. Uh, but, but it's going to be an interesting choice for a lot of people. Well, and let's, and I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I, I do want to, cause I pontificated a little bit when, uh, yesterday that, you know, between baggage and uh, Walker, you know, it's an interesting race because here you have Walker with Malat. Malat, of course, the Democrat, Malat, the Alaska native who, you know, has some, um, who has some uh, uh, loyalty there from, you know, portions of the native and rural vote, but also, of course, the fact that Mark Begich is going on a pro PFD and rural Alaskans were probably damaged the most by the taking of the PFD. And Harold in the chat room telling me that Begich spent a lot of time in rural Alaska last year at economic forums and so on and so forth. So he's really been courting that rural vote. How do you think that really plays out between Begich and uh, and Walker Malott, you know, in the Democratic slice of the electorate. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be interesting. And people to watch, a person to watch in that situation is going to be Bryce Edgman um, uh, and and Lyman Hoffman, probably. I mean, those are uh, legislators from rural Alaska who and in the and, and native community who have supported PFD cuts. Uh, uh, traditional Democrats, but have supported PFD cuts, uh, frankly, uh, because they view it as as the easy way, as the as the way that that the, the easiest easiest path to get additional revenue and support uh, government spending, which is a big factor right. uh, out in the rural rural communities. So um, it's going to be if we end up um, with Dunleavy or Treadwell, and and then Begich and uh, and Governor Walker, it's going to be really interesting uh, to watch Bryce and Lyman uh, and other uh, wrote Donnie Olson, rather other rural representatives. If they go to Begich, uh, that's a that's a positive sign. I think that Begich has strength in the in the in the Bush communities and in the in the uh, Native community, and that. Um, uh, they're they're feeling that and and want to be over with the winner. Don't want to be caught going the wrong direction. Don't want to be caught going against their party. Um, if, however, they continue to support Walker, uh, uh, that's probably a sign that, uh, to me, a sign that Begich will have not caught on uh, as strongly in the uh, rural uh, and in the native community. So it's yeah, I, I'm going to be watching how those legislators, those rural Bush uh, uh, native legislators try to dance around this uh, and, and deal with uh, deal with those two. I don't see them supporting uh, the Republican candidate uh, in, in, in any uh, 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 situation. I, neither Dunleavy nor uh, Treadwell are going to be, uh, are going to be particularly uh, strong in those areas. But um it, it, I think I think the indicator to me of what's going on out in the in the rural and native communities is going to be those rural and native legislators and which way they're going. Brad Keithley is our guest. He's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We've been talking about the the start here of the real political season coming up into election time with the uh, with the uh, primary elections and going on into the generals. That was all the governors. That was the big guns. Let's talk about the undercard, shall we? Which, of course, is the legislature. And we could start off with the, uh, I guess, winners and losers. The the Green Button article from uh, the Midnight Sun, Alaska Midnight Sun. They uh, uh, they talk a lot about some of the winners and losers in there. Let's do some analysis. Well, th- th- that's sort of two different issues. One is one is the legislative races and where they're going to go, and and we can talk about that in a moment. The other one is is what interest groups came out of the legislature 
uh, uh, on a high and which ones came out a low. And Matt Buxton of the Midnight Sun Alaska, the blog Midnight Sun Alaska, and Matt's the former political reporter for the Fairbanks News Miner, um, very solid reporter uh, before he moved over to the Midnight Sun, has continued to to do an outstanding job since he's moved over to the Midnight Sun, published two pieces uh, that that if, if listeners haven't read them, I think should. One uh, is titled The uh, Eight Winners and Some on- Honorable Mentions from the 2018 Session, uh, The Green Button, and then talks uh, has a, a companion piece published a day later that talks about the red button, eight losers, and uh, uh, from the 2018 session, the the one that really uh, struck me uh, as I was reading through the green button um, uh, 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 list, uh, his his winners list, was uh, a title. One of the eight winners was quote the wealthy, and I think <laughs> that just perfectly captures uh, what went on in this legislature. Uh, the special interests, um, those who who wanted to make sure that they got appropriations that went their way, uh, that the money moved their direction, that they got increased funding or or didn't lose funding, they won uh, uh, this cycle. Uh, the budget cuts, the additional budget cuts that the Senate the Senate majority had talked about uh, last year didn't happen this year at all. They stopped talking about them. Uh, and, and the money got moved around in a way that responded to uh, lobbyists and to, and to the special interests. One of those was the wealthy. Uh, and, and the wealthy benefited by, uh, frankly, the funding, funding closing the, the fiscal gap by cutting the PFD, because the PFD has the largest adverse impact uh, focused on Middle income and lower income Alaskans, uh, the top 20 percent, indeed, the, largely the top 10 percent, pay or on, only the top 10 percent pay less uh, under a PFD cut than they would under some form of uh, flat taxation, broad-based taxation, uh, and so they benefited by the additional funding coming from PFD cuts as opposed to moving on to some form of of uh, broad-based tax. So. Including them as a special interest, uh, uh, they benefited uh, uh, out of this session. And so uh, these, uh, and, and another special interest, frankly, that I want to touch on because I think it plays out in some of these legislative races, is the oil industry. The oil industry benefited not only by not having uh, changes in the oil taxes, production tax, which I think was probably a good thing. The legislature didn't go there, but HB 331, which was the oil bonding bill. Uh, the bill to, to issue bonds and and generate a bunch of additional revenue right now through the issuance of bonds in order to pay off all these oil credits. Uh, I think the oil industry was a was was one of the special interests that benefited benefited from this session. So I, I, I think that's a really I think that, I think Matt did a really great way of sort of encapsulating uh, uh, who the winners were and and what special interests uh, really won. Uh, uh, the session cycle. I think that translates to me, that's going to translate into the election cycle, uh, both in terms of focusing on on legislators who were not steadfast, steadfast for the PFD uh, and, and, and where there's choices, uh, uh, looking at candidates who are stronger on the PFD uh, than uh, than than the legislator was uh, during the session, uh, and then using that as sort of a an, an issue to drive home um, the issue of are are you as a legislator looking out for the wealthy, which is what those who voted for PFD cuts are, or are you a legislator who's more concerned about the overall economy and all Alaskans as opposed to just uh, as opposed to just some Alaskans and some Alaska industry. And I think uh, 331 plays out in the election cycle. It's going to play out in the Valley, um, uh, in, 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 in the District 9 race, for example, the George Rauscher, Pam Good race. Uh, Rauscher voted for 331, voted to, to issue those bonds, get more money uh, into the state right now at long-term costs, as we've talked about, significant long-term costs, as we've talked about on the program, in order to you know 
benefit that special interest, right. but it's a long-term detriment of Alaskan. So um, I, I think I think the special interests that were that got the green button uh, during the legislature uh, and the legislators who voted for them are going to have to confront the fact that they voted for special interests. They voted to benefit the wealthy and others uh, during the legislature, and they're they're going to have those challenges in the uh, in the election cycle. Yeah, I mean, we look at this and we look at the winners and losers, and we realize that you know that again. It seems to be continuously, and I know the only reason you chose this Matt Buxton article is that he quotes you extensively in it, but that's okay. It's, <laughs> it's I mean, this is a, I mean, let's face it, Brad, this is a, this is a, a gong that you and I have been banging for years, and you specifically in, in every form of media that you could find, that this is the story that is out there that is not being reported. Buxton's picked it up. No, none of the other new major news medias have really picked up this component of it, that it is, in fact, you know, a way that those who are, you know, the wealthy, the influential are shielding themselves, their incomes and their um, and their supplicants incomes from, uh, you know, government uh, taking by doing this. And I think this is really one of the first times I've seen it out there in a mainstream type outlet, actually acknowledging that this is part of the problem. Yeah, I think this comes out more during the election cycle. The the session's intense. Everybody's down in Juno. They're sort of focused on Juno things. As you and I have talked about, the news media really is just sort of rewriting the press releases issued by the by legislators and by the various caucuses, right? Uh, and not really either having the time or having the ability to dig deeper. But I think once everybody comes home from Juno, sort of has more time as Matt has, and sort of starts seeing in a broader context. Um, I think I think these issues I think this issue starts popping up. One of the things that that and, and, and I would have <laughs> I, I would have listed I, I would have gone to Matt's eight eight green button and eight eight red buttons even without Matt quoting me. But but one of the things I think is important <laughs> when you look at Matt's list, who's not on the winners list? Well, not on the winners list is the overall Alaska economy. It's very it's subsets. Of the Alaska economy, that's uh, the, like the wealthy and state employees and schools and the university system. Those some subsets are on there, but it's at the expense that the, they have they have won at the expense of the overall economy. And the fact that the overall economy isn't listed there, I think, is a good indicator that that it's a loser. And and who's not who's who also is not listed on there is Alaska families. Right. Um, uh, again, as the biggest uh, losers, some subsets. Right? Yeah, as the biggest losers, right? Right. Some subsets on there: the the wealthy, uh, those tied to the university system, those those who benefit from the K through twelve, uh, those who benefit from benefit from the the explosion of money that's coming into the as a result of bonding on oil credits. Uh, they those subsets uh, of Alaska families and Alaska citizens will benefit, but. At whose expense? It's at the expense of the overall uh, Alaska family, the, the the those who are going to be bearing the biggest costs as a result of PFT cuts. So, I, I think that's a I think that way of framing the issue is eight red, his eight green and his eight red uh, is an excellent way of doing it. And then I think that's a way that translates into the election cycle in terms of again looking at District Nine, George Rouser. George, you voted to benefit certain oil companies and certain oil service companies uh, and certain uh, Alaska families tied to those at the expense of the overall economy uh, and at the expense of, of Alaska families in general. How do you justify that? Right. Um, and I think that I, I think that will translate also into, you know, legislators who voted for PFD cuts or legislators who were wishy-washy on PFD cuts. I was trying to track PFD cuts the other way, the other day through the last couple of legislatures, and you see people like Dan Sadler, you know, voting every possible way. Oh yeah, on, on, in, you know, during back and forth during yeah. any given election cycle. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a back and forth for sure. You could see. Uh, I remember having a conversation with Dan Sadler right before he, uh, right before he threw his surprise vote in support of protecting the PFD. Uh, because I had been told that he was on the fence, and so I thought I'd bring him on the program for a discussion about it, and, uh, yeah. and you know, swung the other way. And it's like, man, some of these people just in the wind, not sure which way to go, 
And I think there's probably more of that than we realize when it comes down to it. Yeah, and and the campaigns in those, I mean, Laura Laura Reinbold's going to have her own issues with Sadler in, to run in that campaign. But to me, that's going to be we can't trust you, Dan. Yeah, uh, we can't trust you to be a reliable vote on the PFD. That's not that's not one of your you know uh, Northern Lights. That's not one of your one of your 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 will not change issues. You're just all over the place on it. And so we need somebody in there. Uh, and, and Laura certainly has been reliable on PFD issues. She's not been reliable on other issues, but, but we need somebody in there who's going to, who's going to be reliable on that issue. So I, I think these, I think the stuff that we see in the eight green and eight red and, and, and the other things that you can bring out of the sessions are going to translate into the, into the election cycle. And I think we're going to see opponents both in the primary, uh, again, looking at district nine, uh, and, uh, and, and in the general. Uh, uh, you know, when Bryce Edgman's up against uh, up against his opposition out in the uh, out in the Bristol Bay region, I think we're going to see uh, that sort of those sorts of issues uh, uh, emerge. Let's delve down a little bit into the actual legislators themselves. Uh, lots of different candidates filing for lots of different seats. Still not as many as I'd like to see. I mean, we had all forty of the House of Representatives up for re-election. And when it's all said and done, we have a, actually a very small field of challengers for the incumbencies. But it is uh, there are some good bright spots out there. Um, as you mentioned, George Rauscher has got a challenger in not only in um, Pam Good, but uh, in the in the primary. But her husband actually filed as an independent <laughs> in the general as well, which I thought was classic. I mean, one way or the other, you're going to be fighting one of them. Uh, and then of course he also had got, uh, I guess Jim Clover jumped back into the race. And so, uh, yeah. you know, Bill Johnson and I mean, there's going to be some crowded races for certain seats out there. There are, and, and there's going to be some good, I mean, there's some good races. You've got, uh, uh, you, uh, Chris Birch has a challenger, uh, you know, some unexpected places. Chris, Chris Birch and Becca Hetlett, uh, is going to challenge him in the, in for Kevin Myers old, uh, Senate seat. You've got, uh, Sarah Vance, uh, who's, uh, announced against, uh, Paul Seaton down in Homer. You've got, um, uh, uh, uh Pam Good against, uh, uh, against, uh, uh, Rauscher. You've got, you got, you got some really good races out there. I, you know, I, it would be great if uh, if we had challengers, strong challengers to all of the uh, all of the all of the those who voted for to cut the PFD. But frankly, um, I think this may be what we may want to focus on this election cycle are are key races where the PFD and economic issues are going to be the dividing line. Uh, for example, in the in the uh, uh, Sadler uh, Reinbold race, and and I think those races may send may send a signal uh, to other legislators. If Laura beats Sadler uh, on the PFD issue, uh, I think that's a great signal. I, if Becca if uh, Becca Hetlap beats uh, 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 Chris Birch. Uh, I think that's a. I think that sends a signal. Uh, I think uh, Mia Costello's got some opposition uh, in on the west side. That's going to uh, certainly some in the primary, but also in the uh, uh, in the general. So I, I think there's. I think it's going to boil down to key races, whether the economic issues bubble up as being the key race, and then how that issue is decided. Um, you know, legislators legislators learn. Uh, from what goes on to their, with their peers. If a peer loses because of an issue and they think that issue would resonate in their district, they're going to be more concerned about it uh, going forward. So um, maybe not the quantity uh, of opposition across the board that we want, but the right. quality and the ability to focus these issues in some, in some uh, tight races uh, I think is uh, is going to be uh, is, is going to be where we need to be thinking about. We started off the show with the discussion of the three turncoats in the Republican Party. Um, any idea? Uh, I mean, it looks like that. Uh, uh, you know, of course, as you mentioned, Seaton is going to run as an independent, but he's got Sarah Vance and two other Republicans who are going to duke it out before they face him. Um, I guess Louise Stutz is really not facing any kind of challenge, and even the Republican Party kind of you know, turn their back on that and just said, okay, whatever. It looks like Kodiak loves her, but the big one I think is going to be Gabrielle Ledoux. Any thoughts on, on how those three races are going to turn out or any, you know, kind of insight there? 
You know, I really haven't delved down into either the Stutes race or the uh, Ledoux race uh, yet. I thought Stutes did draw some opposition down there, so I'm, I'm going to need to go back and look at that. But I haven't, I haven't delved down into either Kodiak or or uh, or Ledoux yet. Uh, I, Seton's going to be really interesting. I mean, Paul Seton has survived in in uh, in that district in in, in prior challenges. Um, there's been, you know, challengers, the last re- strong Republican challengers, uh, the last two election cycles, he survived both of those. Uh, to some degree, Homer's just sort of a different place. And and sort of like, you know, David Eastman, that's what District 10 wants, uh, or, or District 8, whichever it is. That's that's what that district wants. Uh, you know, Homer, Seton is sort of what Homer's traditionally wanted. Sarah Vance uh, uh, is is a, a, I think a strong and articulate opponent. Um, she's got to survive the primary. There's other Republicans in the primary. Paul's moved out of the Republican Party. He's now moved. He's now running as an independent, um, and so he's not going to have just sort of the automatic knee jerk uh, R vote uh, showing up for him uh, in that district. I, that's going to be a race to watch. Right. Um, Sarah's a relatively new candidate, uh, someone who doesn't have, who hasn't run uh, extensively before. I think she ran for city council, and I think she lost, uh, but doesn't have a, a huge amount of experience. So, you know, whether she's going to make rookie mistakes or not, uh, but that's that's a. I think there's going to be a strong run down there, and I think the party is going to support whoever comes out of that primary. Um, I'm just I'm, I haven't focused yet on on Ledoux and on Stoops. Well, it seems like every time we talk, Brad, we get longer and longer into it. It's because we just get deeper and deeper. But let's uh, we've, we've we've covered two topics in our time for three. But let's move on to three. I'm just going to hold you over, and we'll just talk about our third of your top three for the week, and that, of course, is the opportunity China, which of course is the governor's uh, mandate to get things rolling. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well. They had the big trade delegation uh, go over there, um, and I think uh, the governor's, probably his campaign manager's hope was the governor was going to come back with uh, uh, larger, you know, more support, uh, possibly in terms of written agreements or uh, or more definitive uh, uh, terms than, than what they've had before, or at least sort of, you know, very strong rhetoric coming out of China about we're going to do this deal. They didn't get uh, any of that. They uh, the the one quote uh, the uh, Alaska Public Media sent uh, somebody over with uh, 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 the delegation and uh, who followed along uh, some of these meetings, to at least the ones that the press could could um, uh, participate in. And after the after uh, Walker and the Alaska delegation met with Sinopec, which is the the state oil and gas company, uh, the Chinese state oil and gas company uh, that's involved in the Alaska project, uh, the president of Sinopec uh, made a statement, and he and the statement was, "quote After after some of the work we did in terms of assessment and evaluation in technology, economics, and in terms of the resources of Sinopec." I think there's a lot more work for us to be done than originally imagined. So that's that's sort of anything but, you know, the kind of statement that Walker would have wanted to come out of those meetings. Right. The done but deal. Frankly, right. I, <laughs> yeah. the I'm done, sorry. The done deal that he wanted. Oh, look, I've got this as a turnkey deal. We can just we can put it to the bank. I mean, this is a little bit different than that. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and it's far from the ringing endorsement, I think, that that he hoped from that, from that meeting. But frankly, I think that has almost nothing to do with Walker or the Alaska project, the larger context that's going on uh, uh, with China right now, that's going to, that the Alaska project's been sucked up into uh, is this trade war or this, or this potential for a trade war uh, between the Trump administration um, and China, the the potential of implementing uh, additional tariffs, the the effort to try to negotiate a resolution of the of of the trade war um, uh, uh, through uh, China's commitment to uh, buy additional goods and services from 
uh, from the United States. And every time, every time you see an article about that about that trade disp- dispute between the U.S. and China, and it talks about China buying more goods and services focused on energy and our farm products, just 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 put Alaska LNG in 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 place of the comment on energy. Energy is a bigger issue. There's oil and there's other LNG projects, but Alaska LNG has been been uh, sort of sucked up into into that discussion. So, um, what was going on at the same time the, the Walker administration's over there on this trade delegation is the Trump administration, which the prior week had looked like they were on track to work out a deal with China, right. uh, in which China would make a commitment to buy additional goods and services. All of a sudden, the Trump administration jumps up and and announces uh, the implementation of fifty billion dollars of additional tariffs right. uh, on the Chinese spread bro- spread broadly. That pretty much sucked all the air out of the room, all the air that otherwise might have been in the room in the discussion with the Alaska delegation, because the Chinese are not going to make a commitment to quote the energy projects. Uh, part of which is the Alaska LNG. They're not going to make a commitment to that. They're not going to good, say good things about it uh, as long as that national trade dispute is up in the air. So uh, it looked, frankly, at the beginning of the of the of the Alaska trip over to China that the timing was perfect because it began in the context of of the discussions between the Chinese and the U.S. that had occurred over. Uh, in the U.S. and Secretary Mnuchin, Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin, had said we're going to put the the sanctions, these uh, uh, tariffs, on hold uh, while we negotiate the terms of this trade deal. Uh, and the Chinese were responding very favorably. And it looked like, you know, boy, Walker lucked out on this because they're going to be saying good things about the about energy and the Alaska LNG project while he's over there. And then all of a sudden, bam! The U.S. administration turns, does the fifty billion dollars in uh, in additional tariffs. Uh, and uh oh, that you know, this is a bad time to be over there, right? Um, and so I think I think the comments that we've seen out of the out of the meeting have very little to do with the Alaska LNG project. If tomorrow uh, the Trump administration, <laughs> excuse me, if tomorrow the Trump administration turned back around and said, "Yep, we got a deal, we got a deal with China for X billion dollars in, in additional goods and services," I think you would say the Chinese saying, "Yep," and Alaska is part of that. And, you know, let's sit down and finalize these terms. But as long as that's up in the air, the Alaska LNG project is going to stay up in the air. Um, and uh, and we're going to have results from uh, from these meetings that look like this one, which was sort of, yeah, I'm glad you came. Thanks for taking the time. Have, have a safe trip home. <laughs> Thanks for bringing all these folks over here. We appreciate it. Here's some knickknacks. There's the door. I mean, that was kind of what was all said and done. Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, – I don't know. I thought I think that Walker expected this to be a much bigger deal in the long run and kind of a shot in the arm for his campaign uh, that he was, uh, you know, that he was really looking for. But there, as you point out, there are bigger factors at play. Um, And this actually gets even deeper into things like national debt and other things that we've been talking about with China holding a trillion dollars of our debt. This uh, this is a troubling time in a lot of ways. And. We're going to have to find a way to, to reach the middle ground with these folks. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to listen to my show with Mike Shower uh, last week where we talked uh, in depth about China, but it is very concerning to see exactly how these things are playing out in the realm you know, internationally uh, on these things, let alone the impact on Alaska. Yeah, there's. I mean, China is in the middle of what they're called a Belt and Road Initiative with, uh, with Africa. Excuse me. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative with Africa and and Europe and uh, and Southern Asia, where China is making a substantial, proposing to make substantial investments in infrastructure um, in in those countries. And there's been some um, initial results out of out of some of those some of those deals. Uh, that's a little bit troubling. And to some degree, uh, you could view uh, the Alaska investment as being as being an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, or the potential for an Alaska investment as being a, a, an extension of the Belt and Road Initiative, and you can, you know, the 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 problems that you've seen come out of Belt and Road, you can you can you know potentially apply to Alaska as well. I think there's a difference, uh, frankly, uh, 
because of the way the Trump administration has has gotten us into this trade uh, issue with with China, I think the resolution of that of that trade issue, because it's with the United States, is going to be different than what you've seen with with a lot of Belt and Road, uh, a lot of the Belt and Road pieces. Um, and I think if it comes, if there is a deal done, uh, I think it will be stronger and and better constructed than what than what you're generally seeing uh, with uh, with Belt and Road. But uh, I mean, so that's sort of the good news to Walker, right? Uh, uh, Trump's positioned it to make the, to get the Alaska project uh, sort of front and center as as one of the great things that can be accomplished. But the downside is, <coughs> excuse me. But the downside is. Um, Trump, you, you're, 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 you, there's the good and there's the bad. I mean, you're living in a situation in which one week it looks like the Trump administration is on its way to a deal with China, and the next week they just announced fifty billion dollars of additional right. additional tariffs, and and hugely, you know, disconnected from China. So, um, well, that, I, that, we, we'll see where it ends up. I, I I don't think I don't think. The parade of horribles that come out of Belt and Road. I don't think we automatically ought to apply those to Alaska, uh, but we we need to know about them and we need to be careful that they don't apply to Alaska when we get to the final terms. Well, and I think you just touched on something that I've been thinking about. You know, when you look at this. Let's just say China, you know, inks some kind of deal with Alaska, where they again the seventy five percent ownership. They 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 go all in. They do all this, but then the speculation comes back again to what happens in kind of this schizophrenic you know trump's kind of schizophrenic uh uh you know his actions oh you're my friend oh you're my enemy or my friend and my enemy you know uh you've got that going on what if china wants to hold us over a barrel over something i mean all of a sudden they've got started they've got 75 percent ownership on something and all of a sudden they say well let's we're just going to stop for now until you guys give us favorable more favorable turns on something else that has nothing to do with alaska i mean there's a lot of components in there that really make me nervous about that whole situation yeah, it, and 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 justifiably so. I mean, uh, so Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross went over to China last weekend, this past weekend, to try to continue the negotiations that uh, the Secretary Mnuchin had talked about uh, in New York uh, to being positive. And basically, Ross got stonewalled. I mean, he came away sort of like Walker with nothing. You know, here's here's I'm glad you use our hotels. I'm glad you paid us for it. Have a safe trip home. I mean, um, and 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 the Chinese made a big point out of look, we had these good meetings in New York. We thought we were making progress. Then we get the 50 billion dollars in additional tariffs, um, and and so we're going to be very reticent. Chinese talking. We're going to be very reticent about uh, about these deals, and we're going to put in all sorts of outs. Right. So that if you know the the administration goes off in another direction again, <coughs> excuse me, that we're not stuck, uh, uh, you know, over the barrel where you, you know we've got investment commitments made, and all of a sudden the Trump administration or the, any administration is is changing the rules of the game. So there's a lot of mutual distrust that's going on right now, um, and in deals, I've done a lot of deals in my life, a lot of deals in the oil and gas industry where you have mutual distrust. It's hard to bring a deal together. Um, so I think, I, I, and, and Walker, you know, to Walker's detriment, not a Walker supporter, but, you know, from, from what he hoped was going to happen, I think we're going to be at this for a while. I don't, I don't think this is, um, I don't think this is an issue because of the distrust that's been created. Uh, I don't think this is an issue that resolves itself overnight. It looked like we might have been headed there before this $50 billion of additional tariffs, but that's changed dramatically. Right. right. Um, and so, yeah, we got, <clears throat> we got to get a deal done. Uh, and then we got to look for all of the outs that the Chinese have put in there. Um, and, you know, and be concerned about how those are going to impact any of investment in Alaska. I will say this, having Chinese money invested in Alaska is better than not. Uh, if the Chinese have put money into a project and 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 have sunk costs into a project, uh, uh, it's better than them not having than than us having financed it all ourselves uh, and the Chinese walking yep. away. So uh, that's a good thing uh, to have uh, some Chinese investment, some Chinese money uh, sunk uh, in this project. It will make them more likely to follow through to, to, to avoid leaving that money uh, just sort of laying around. Uh, un, unused and, and, and not producing returns. Uh, but 
we've got a because of this fifty billion dollars in tariffs um, and and the and the and the distrust that's been created, uh, we got a long way to go before this deal uh, deal comes to fruition. Now, Brad Keithley, final thoughts. Let's wrap this up quickly and get things down. I appreciate you coming on board. What, what do we need to be doing? What do we need to be watching? Where do we need to be going? We need to be looking out for the overall Alaska economy. That, that to me is first and foremost, the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families. That means we need to be looking for candidates who haven't you know, been, been caught up by special interests voting to benefit some Alaskans over others. We need to be looking for legislators and legislative candidates that are looking out for the overall economy uh, and not being, uh, not being caught up uh, in special interests. I think the, the best test of that is how they feel on the PFD. Uh, and then the second best test of that is how they voted on particular things, HB 331, the old, the old credit bond being one of them. Right. Um, and and I think that carries through uh, both in the governor's race and in the legislative races. And frankly, it carries through uh, in the China negotiations as well. Are they looking out for the overall Alaska economy or are there just you know certain parts that are, that are going to benefit from it? Brad Keithley has been our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You'll find the link in the top of the uh, post here on Facebook, and you could also just search up Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, as always, a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks for coming in and joining us today. We really appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for giving me the opportunity. It's great to have these discussions with you. The Michael Duke Show, your home for common sense, liberty-based, free-thinking thought and discussion. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.